This week's episode of Modern Art Family Tree is brought to you by the Foster Gallery. The Foster Gallery is a gallery in Worcester, Massachusetts, who specializes in paintings, drawings, and prints. Find them at www.thefostergallery.com. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is the Modern Art Family Tree, episode two. We've made it to number two. Uh, my name is Matthew Foster, and with me, as usual, is Dennis Hart. And uh, today we are going to be talking about the second artist that we were going to bring up in the Modern Art Family Tree, which is Mie. Um, and uh, uh, for those who don't know Mie, and, and some people have said Mille, right, which is another possible uh, pronouncement of the name, but, uh, but I don't know, Dennis. When I was in school, we always said Mie. That's the thing that I was used to. I think some teachers said it one way, and, and others have said it the other. So I'm, I'm, I can't say I've heard it one way more than the other. Right, right, and I would say the same thing. So, um, so Mie was um, a, a, a contemporary to Corbet, who we talked about last week, right? And and I would venture to say, without us delving into you know too much of the stuff yet, that he was kind of uh, a little bit on the other side of the fence as far as the radical. Not so much in painting, but like socially, not as radical as as Corbet was as a personality. I mean, uh, he, he kind of had his ups and downs in popularity, but ultimately he ended his life actually being on the salon as one of the jurors on the salon. So he was definitely more of your typical artist trying to make it in the in the regime and the the way and you know ways forward in the time. Um, what's your feedback on that? I would I would agree. I, I don't have anything to, you know, oppose that. Um, I just I, I wonder and I don't I don't know this for certain, but it's it just seems like an important part of his story, of course, is is his, his upbringing and his uh, in a peasant community. And I'm not sure if that, um, you know, that that would probably change some of that. Well, that well actually, a good point to be made, though, is so, and again, I'm tying this back to us from Corbet last time. This is kind of the first generation where we care about their upbringing. I mean, okay. And no, you know what I'm saying, though, is that is that it's becoming about the artist and about what the artist is experiencing and how they're making stuff. And, and before this time period, that's a secondary notion. That's... <laughs> Right, they're they're more like a hammer in a toolbox, you know. They're, they're an artist is somebody that you ask to do something for you, and it doesn't matter where they came from and what they did. But but at this point, you're right. It it does become uh, an important part of their story. So so as you said, he comes from a very peasant oriented um, um, area, right? Mm -hmm. And he he is. Uh, Definitely. I mean, and as soon as we start getting to the actual paintings, it, it's very, very obvious that he is influenced by his surroundings and his immediate intact, uh, his immediate taken from his local community. Okay. I mean, he, he's definitely not a bourgeois guy, would be my impression. Mm -hmm. um, but on, on top of that, you know, uh, uh, his style, and again, I know we haven't brought up the paintings yet, but my initial reaction to his style is you can definitely see his where Van Gogh comes from uh, later on. I mean, I, I think Mie is a direct lineage going forward to Van Gogh, especially Van Gogh's earlier work. You know, the 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 very Dutch feeling colors and the and the browns and the and the earth tones and the the heavy emphasis on on the the uh, the paint. I, yeah. yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it becomes pretty clear. So, so <laughs> what happens? He he grows up. He goes. Uh, he he obviously trains, and he uh, everything I ever read about him, he was heavily into literature, and uh, was um, interested in literature, and and yeah. dabbled in poetry and things like that, and then went to Barbizon, right? Which mm -hmm. is where we get the term for the school, the Barbizon School. Which would you say he's the leader of the Barbizon School, or is he just kind of one of the good, good representations of it? I mean, he's definitely one of the names that comes up first when you talk about Barbizon painting. Right. He may have just been one of the, you know, the the more 
well known of the of the group. I'm not real sure. I, I, I that's a good a good question to raise. I, I don't know if he was sort of the founder or if he was just a member that happened to get more notoriety. Yeah. Uh, and and he was one of those you know those people in France that his notoriety would fluctuate. He uh, his his early salon entries were well received it seems like and then his you know when he did some of these things that were more about the peasant classes and stuff like that uh, he seemed like he got some of the backlash and some of that maybe because of his you know because he didn't have that personality that Corbet had at the time where Corbet was much more flamboyant so that it was you know that kind of work seemed to be accepted differently um, but anyways let's let's start with one of the paintings and start talking about that so uh, you want to start with the gleaners? I mean, that that's a uh, a art fan favorite usually. I think so. That's a great place to start. Okay, and uh, I'm bringing it up on screen here. And um, why don't you go ahead and talk to it? I mean, uh, what, what's your what's your impressions there? Well, just like uh, just the way we spoke about uh, the Stonebreakers with uh, with well, what we talked about last week. It's a lot. It's along those same lines, right? Where we're talking about uh, a, a group of peasant workers and you know putting them center stage and showing them. I, I think that that was probably a little jarring to many at that at that time. Um, but the way that he's done it in this painting, where they're sort of they're sort of central and large, and the landscape is beautiful behind them, very flat. Um, it just it's 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 hard to dismiss it, you know. I think it's it's a it's a difficult painting to to just say, well, this isn't of of anything that I consider important. So I I don't, you know. There's a lot of beauty in this, whether it be, you know, somebody from royalty or or peasants working in the field. That's right. No, I I would agree with that. And now, just to be clear for those who, not that everybody knows, you know, phrases from old French times, but gleaning was a, was kind of a shunned practice, right? Gleaning, at the time that this was made, gleaning was an activity that poor people did, and basically they were picking up the remnant pieces of wheat and stuff so that they could, uh, you know, go and make food. I mean, so basically this was crops being kept. And then the, the poorest of the poor would go out to the fields and see what they could get for, for you know, uh, basically, you know, crumbs um, from leftover. So this activity of what they're doing was the far, far, far opposite of anything grandiose. I mean, you know, this would be, this would be a, a, us doing a painting of a homeless person on the, under a bridge trying to stay warm. You know what I mean? It's like the Oliver Twist of... Uh... Yeah, of French society right yeah you know but in contrast to that when you're looking at it as a picture these bodies these people are very weighted they're very uh dense you know heavy they're they're not they're not light and airy passerby type figures they're front and center and they're they're very i mean if if you were to ask me i they feel like sculpture they feel like heavy things that are weighing down on the picture plane, which for people not used to looking at old paint, that's somewhat a significance of an importance factor. You know what I mean? That that is a that is one of the the kind of old tricks as far as uh, someone being relegated as an important figure in a painting. They're also not emaciated, which I find interesting. Not that they should be, but you know you're gonna you're gonna be forced to to go out and pick up scraps. You know you you, you have to expect them to be somewhat emaciated but they look rather healthy you know That's maybe right. this was the way of life for them for so long they found a way to make it work yes no i would agree with that you know it's definitely uh it's a interesting painting. i think from a from a technical standpoint um it's still looser it's still kind of extending from that romantic period kind of kind of feeling going into the realist type movement so that that follows the Corbet kind of feeling. I mean, you can definitely tell that he was an active, actively understanding Corbet's way of painting also, and and was not isolated from that. I mean, you can definitely kind of get a sense of of that looser brush stroke and the and that sensibility of the paint coming out a little bit more. Um, and again, that is uh, you know kind of a trampoline effect to when we hit Van Gogh, I think. Um, 
and it's interesting to me just more of the tying to Van Gogh, you know, the, the, the stubs on the ground of the wheat and stuff, that to me that is like pure predecessor of a Van Gogh wheat field. Yep, yep, um, you're absolutely right. I, I you know, <laughs> I, I think uh, we'll we'll come back to me when we're talking about uh, exactly. Van Gogh a lot because it's, it's certainly uh, certainly had a, a lot of influence on him. Yeah, I, I would agree, and, and I would say that if Van Gogh, and this is the Mie fans out there are going to be horrified with this statement, but I would say that if Van Gogh was not as wildly famous as he is, and, and, and uh, with notoriety of painters and stuff, would the importance of Mie in this time show? You know what I mean? Without that linkage to Van Gogh. And maybe it's an unfair statement. I don't know. I mean, fight me on this if you're if you want to. But I would almost wonder if Mie's prominence in this time, as far as us historically looking back at him, would seem as relevant if it weren't for some of that influence on the Van Goghs and the Cezanne and stuff. You might be. You might be absolutely right. I, I can't dispute that. I mean, uh, the, the histories that we're taught in school are, are, are that way for a reason. We, you know, I. I wonder. I mean, he he. I'll say this, in, if I can oppose you. Sure. With this statement, he certainly enjoyed more success in his lifetime than Van Gogh did. That's very true. Yeah. That is very true. And and he knew, but but he was also smart enough to work that system. Some. I mean, he was actively in the salons, and he was, you know, and and, and in all honesty, his painting style was not so radically different textually that people would be like fearful of it i mean which yeah. which that's usually how that that's usually how that happens those that are more radical are the ones that that uh it takes more time to you know accept and yes. in van gogh's case it was you know it was more accepted after he had died very true all right so let's let's go to um let's bring up a different one and the, the next one is the um which one is this this is the um, the sower, right? Yeah. Sorry, I had a minute there trying to get it back up. So the sower, I would say, for people that are not painters who have looked at a lot of Mie, I think that this is probably one of the more recognizable paintings. Do you think that's a fair one? I mean, if I were to, you know, if someone was a somewhat educated, you know, painting fan, and I said Mie, to me, this is the first one I probably think of. No, uh, I'm not sure I do. I think of either the Gleaners or um, there's one like I mentioned before of, of uh, the of people working on a hardwood floor. I, I don't even know the name of that painting. That's how well I know it, but it's it's what I think of when I think of Mie. That's interesting. I think it's funny. I think of this one and I think of the Gleaners. I, th I guess the like Gleaners would be the other one that would come to mind for me. So why don't you talk about this one a bit? I, I think you know. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in in. Comparison to the Gleaners, uh, uh, the first striking thing about this is is the lack of flat land, right? I mean, he's he's running, he's he's throwing seeds down uh, on a hill, on a crop that's on a hill, right? Um, but the composition, because of that hill, it makes the composition very dynamic because there's that slight diagonal across the uh, you know the horizon line of the of the painting. But there's also something a little more, you know, the style of the figure, and and I, I mean, this this is something that I I've seen all the way up through, you know. Uh, it, it reminds me of some of the sort of more graphic, uh, simplified figures you see in I don't know industrial uh, posters and things like that. You know, okay. um, it, it is very simplified and 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 yet. And, and yet exciting no i would agree with that yeah i mean it, it's got a you're you're very right with that horizon line it, it it adds it adds weight to the to the like the gravity of him going down the hill you know it is it is definitely improved by it's like the exact uh decline that you need for it to make sense with his movement you know mm -hmm. but uh, and i would say that the painting style the application style is kind of an interesting mix because you you have the there's obviously this this desire in Mie to to be more painterly to me to to show a little bit more of the painting action it seems like 
But there's also, some of this feels like, and it might be just the way the colors come in from like the lower leg and everything. I, I just keep thinking of like Rembrandt. And, and like the kind of, not so much the colors maybe, but like the application, like the way it's, it's soft on the edges, but then vibrant in the middle. You know what I mean? So the shadows move away from the middle of the, of the figure and stuff. And it feels like a softer version of like a, a Rembrandt style painting. Um, I don't know. I, I might be crazy, but that, that's something that I, that I see in it, you know? Um, so Socially, I mean, you know, as far as this being a picture that people at the time were seeing, it, it kind of follows the same mentality as the gleaners, right? For the most part, I mean, it's a man working in the fields, and this is not a royal feeling. This is, is this worthy of being put on canvas? You know, that, that kind of thing. So, I mean, and we talked about the same kind of feeling from Corvée last week, um, but, or last time we talked at least, and, and it, it kind of runs that same gambit, right, for the most part? So, the uh, I would say that this is less concrete looking than the Gleaners, which I think is obvious. Um, but talk a little bit about the atmospheric look of this, because this is starting to lean towards almost what you could see where the impressionists are coming from and things like that. It does. It does. It has kind of both directions going on with it, though. I mean, yeah, sure. I can see it leaning or leading towards the the impressionists, but I can also see what you were saying earlier about the Rembrandt feel to it, right? Where there's the real darkness to the shadow underneath the brim of his hat. Yeah. And and the ground is in shadow, right? Because that sun must be on the other side of that hill. Um, actually, by whatever is off in the distance there to the right, above the, the horizon line, you can see that the sun is off to the left someplace. And so everything to the right or to, to, to below it is all going to be in shadow. So it creates some sort of dynamic contrast right with with whatever's getting whatever's catching the light the, the chin the jaw of his face right or just getting enough of it i mean that that sort of dramatic light i think is something that we saw a lot with rembrandt because because they were working with candlelight you know and and or with window light and, and darker rooms so everything is very very high contrast um, so I, I'm, I know you're asking me to talk about maybe going towards the future, and I, I want to talk more about the past. No, no, well, is, that, but, well, but that's where it comes from. I mean, yeah. And so, so yeah, but I do see the, the atmospheric part of this. You know, it's loosened up a bit, right? It's not as, it's not as tight and 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 stiff, and I don't want to say realistic, but I mean it is realistic. But it, it it's maybe the, the the break point for this piece is is the actual movement. That you can yeah. that he's captured here. I agree. It, yeah. It's it's not um, it's far from it's far from being very static. And I mean, it, it's a guy running down a hill, so he shouldn't it shouldn't be static. But even the way he's painted, I don't know if that's the top of his boots. Or, I mean, they almost look like there's a blur, an intentional blur. I agree. To 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 accent that movement, but also the simplification of the figure, like I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. Well, I, I could see the academia just going back to those boots, like you were saying. I mean, it, you just kind of sparked something to me. Is I could easily see the academia at the time going, you didn't finish the painting. Right, right, right. I mean, you know, because that's the ma mindset of the time. Is they're not, they're not, they're. I don't want to say they're not interested, but they're not used to this idea of of capturing motion and and light well, and you know. This might be a trick that you know he picked up from the technology of the time, which we had mentioned in the last podcast as well, which is photography. I mean, maybe maybe he saw a photo of somebody in motion and, and, and it, it spurred him to think, hey, why couldn't you do this with paint? You know, why does it... That's a very good Why point. does everything in paint have to be so static and stiff? Can we, can we loosen it up just a little bit and create a sense of motion? Uh, I, I'm not. I can't verify that what I'm saying is true, but I, I, I get the sense that that could be how this happened. Yeah. Well, and the way that the the outline of his head and shoulders and stuff against the background of the sky is photographic feeling to me also. Mm -hmm. Like because it's not a high. You know, in, in older paintings, you would have like a Goya. You would have a a high blue contrast 
that that really well cut out that that figure. These almost have like a glaze that merges the two together. You know what I mean? Like like a fog that merges yeah. the two together. So good. All right. Well, let's let's move on to the the final piece that we're going to show of his, which is um, called uh, uh, Leangelis um, or Angelus Domine, right? But this was a uh, painting done a little later, I would say. And uh, it was a commission for actually a guy from Boston. Can you believe that? <laughs> I, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it was, it was a commission for a guy from Boston. And um, it was originally called The Prayer for the Potato Field, I want to say. And I'm really glad they changed the name. <laughs> Right. So, uh, but basically, it's it's you know peasants praying, uh, doing basically what I would what I would assume based on the name a, a daily prayer that they would do out in the fields, um, and and like I said, it was a commission. So this is a little little more static compared to what I think was mulling in his head. But it was a commission that took him a long time to make. So, what are your thoughts on this one, Dennis? Well, I mean, as far as the social aspect of it, it's 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 very it's it's very touching. But it's again, it's just like with the gleaners. I mean, it's also a matter of the beauty. Yeah. I mean, the, the time of day he chose to show it, where they're starting to become sort of sh shadowed silhouettes against that beautiful sky. Uh, it, you know, it's it's one of those things. It, it, there's a lot of detail in the field. I mean, the the. The shadow from the pitchfork is kind of nice. I mean, it's just so many little things. The the grasses, the the I don't want to call them weeds because farmers hate that word. But yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of things, that, a lot of little detail that it's it, it's very vastly different from the last one. Um, it the is sower, I agree. because of the detail, right? Because of its its crispness. I mean, there's not supposed to be motion in this one, so we can, you know. We can accept the fact that there's very clean edges and very static. It's, it's a fairly static image, but it's the, just it carries a lot of beauty with it. The dynamic range of highlights in this is very different too. It's not as muted feeling as right. the other one, you know. Well, and, and and this this teeters on. I, and I I hate to say this because I I don't think this, but I can see someone saying is this one seems to have, and the wrong word is this one seems to have more color because I think that that is an incorrect way to say it but i think this has more hue contrast i think this has more contrast in the colors uh and then the mark making is a little sharper so it ident so it, it kind of it, it accentuates that more and the reality of it may actually be that it is quite muted but the contrast of what you see and at this at this late time in the day between what's you know shadowed and what's not becomes so dramatic that you you see the intense color as being actually more more colorful or you know more dynamic I guess. dynamic yeah. yeah yeah and that's an interesting thing for people to to realize that don't look at art like on a normal base or you know don't don't get judgy about art the way we do right but <laughs> but you know that but you know that that there's a difference between color and i hear people say stuff like that all the time is they'll see a more muted image that still has color you know i mean the, that's the funny conversation about brown right people go well, i hate it because it's all brown well brown is is a composite of colors there really is no such thing as just brown as itself you know and and so you can have a lot of different browns and still say there's a ton of color in there mm -hmm. so so it's a it's an interesting point to make is that of the three that we brought up i would say that this one has the largest amount of range and you're exactly right is because of the time of day he picked it had a higher range of of hues and and more of a dynamic range of hues so it, it feels more vibrant um uh, but it also feels more solid this feels more solid than than the sewer by far i mean the the figures feel more chiseled out not as much as the gleaners i don't think i think the gleaners are, is still more of a of an of a um typical French work that was making a statement at the time you know what I mean um, where this this feels like a later work he's got a he's got a a way of making marks and he's got a way you know what I mean he's kind of felt through some of that already and uh, the commission speaks to that too somebody wanted him to make this so, 
Another thing that I read about this one is that the steeple in the background was not originally there. And uh, once he changed it to a the prayer, uh, you know, the, the name, he added the steeple just as a poignant piece. An interesting point about this, too, is that, you know, you look back, again, a few hundred years prior to this with all those religious paintings, and there are very many of them where the sky is very dramatic. Yeah. It's almost like he's calling back, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a historic uh, uh, approach. What can I bring to, you know, 1857, 1859 that has been uh, throughout time, you know, considered uh, religious or, or, you know, exactly. uh, inspiring, uh, you know. Oh yeah, opening the opening up to heaven type of thing. I think there's there's got to be a reference to that here that he was going for. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and uh, you know the other thing that I always <laughs> this is just the bizarre mind of Matt, right? Is also you notice that the horizon line is perfectly balanced so that it doesn't cut their heads off. Which, which to me is funny because some Russian paintings, it's interesting that some cultures are very, very cautious of that and other cultures aren't. And the French were highly, because of all the, the headings and all the, all the other stuff, is, you know, the revolutions and everything, that uh, it's just a little side note. It's nothing artistic. You know, it, it is artistic, but it's not. Um, but they're very careful not to decapitate anybody with the horizon line. Uh, and on that, you know, there's a, there's kind of a standard with uh, landscape painting uh, about the horizon line, where you place that. You know, it's either a third the way up the canvas, halfway up the canvas, or, you know, two thirds up the canvas. And and he seems to stick within the accepted, you know, um, formula for how how to yeah. how to create a, a, a beautiful landscape painting. Yep, yep. No, he's definitely definitely knowledgeable about it. So one thing we got we're we're right on time here, which is awesome. Um, one thing we do need to bring up about Mie, which is very important to art history, and it's not so much about the paintings, but more of a change that happened because of him, which is he, even though he had his ups and downs throughout his career, he kept growing in popularity in general. And at, at the end of his life, he was on the salon, he had some famous paintings, he was well known, right? But he actually died penniless, like he died in poverty. Um, not, I don't know if he was penniless, but he not well off. And he actually had a wife and many kids, actually, he had quite a few kids. But the, the law to protect artists for, um, it's called um, Dois de Suis, uh, but it's it basically the law to compensate artists and their heirs, it was changed to and their heirs, for resale of their work, was because of Mie. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, so if if people, you know, for those out there who think, you know, things like that have been around since the beginning of time to protect art, this is when that particular, for France at least, that particular law came about, and he's the reason that did it. His family was kind of put into a very, you know, well they say here on the web, very poor estate, but um, they changed it because of his situation. Um, Do you was it just that his work uh, didn't sell for what it was worth th during his lifetime? Was it mismanagement? I mean, what, what do you suppose caused him to be? I don't I, know. I mean, I mean, I think that uh, some of his work was going for good amounts, um, you know, towards the end of his life. I don't know if it was resold, though, after he sold it. That might be, uh, the, the, uh, that might be the catch in this, is that he may have, as an example, had many pieces because he was connected to the salon shown and hung in the salon but then they'd be resold to an actual private person and nobody in his family would see any benefit from that mm. so uh, just an interesting side note again the, the, one of those you know things that you're walking through the the museum oh it's a millet you know, Mille or Mie, and and uh, and you know that it's just one of those things that i always find those kind of things fascinating because that that impacts all painters from then on out you know so, the only thing I haven't heard him called is Millet. Yeah, Millet. <laughs> that's right. I think I think any art student that went in and said Millet would be clearly considered didn't do their homework then. Right? <laughs> Possibly. So, yeah. But there's nothing so, wrong with that. If that's how you want to pronounce it, go for it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. As long as people know who what you're saying. So, uh, so good. Well, um, we covered a lot. I mean. Uh, 
that is that is the story in a in a nutshell, right? From two painters' opinions on Mie and where he kind of fits. So for those of you who have seen him in the museum before and you know that, you know, it must be important, it's in the museum type thing, but you, you see the Corbet across the room, now you get a little bit more of a snapshot of where those two fit together. They were contemporaries of each other. Corbet was probably, in my opinion, a little bit more of a radical painter as far as a personality and an artist himself. Millet was more of a traditional painter in the sense of how he was working the circuit and 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 get, trying to get work his way through the the profession of being an artist. I would I would say he's probably more, you know, working from rather than trying to shake things up. He's just working from what he's what he's lived in, as right. opposed to uh, Courbet, who is I think probably trying to shake things up. I agree. Very very well said. That that's probably the most accurate way to say it. Um, and and then but. You know, uh, in Mie's defense, he he ended his life being on the salon, which was still the high point of of the social scale for a painter. Um, so he definitely did not do poorly. Um, and now we all know him as a famous painter. So you know, he's doing better than the two of us, right? <laughs> in that regard. So okay, that is it. We will uh, we'll be back with more. Um, but we we can now put number two in the can as far as uh, on our tree. Excellent. All right. Thanks again, Dennis. We'll talk to you yeah. next time. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.